like if, if this is their first time going into a tech role, if you like, yeah, the hunger there is undeniable, mm-hmm. right? And what I found previously is when you hire people who've been in SDR roles before, and then mm-hmm. they come into a new SDR role, yeah. all they're focusing on is the next step, right? Mm-hmm. They're not focusing mm-hmm. on the journey to get to that next step, whichever yeah. which it may be. Yeah. So, um. And ultimately, it opens up the pool, right? The talent mm. pool for a number of different people out there. And I think going from people's experience, um, personal experience, and also different sales experience they're currently in, I think it's just, yeah, it's just always worked really well for, for my team, basically. <laughs> Hello listeners, watchers, fans and subscribers and including the happy podders. Welcome to a brand new chapter of the SDR Disco Call Show. And at this point, I'd like to give an introduction if you're brand new and it's your first time joining us. This show is about the world of tech sales and sales development. Tech sales, think about software such as Brandwatch, LinkedIn or the apps that you use on your phone. And when it comes to salespeople, it could be these people that are either introducing this service to you on an outbound level or perhaps inbound when you've been on the website and you want to have a demo and stuff. And my job and my role in this show is to find great and interesting people that work in this industry, understand how did they get into this, pick their brains as to how did they build their career within sales development to help you understand what is this all about. Perhaps you're also in this role and you want to get some insights and tips. And my name is Neil Booyan. If you're watching this on our YouTube channel, what would really help us out is if you give a like, comment, and subscribe down below. And if you're listening to this in your local podcast platform, and again, if you're driving, don't do this whilst you're driving, but please give us a comment, share, and rating, and help get the word out there by sharing this episode. So with this episode, I'm very excited because we've had this guest through the door already. And that conversation was so good that I asked this person to come back onto the show. So Gez, could you reintroduce yourself? Who are you? What do you do? Where do you work? And what do they do? Thanks for that, Neil. So uh, I'm Ashley Ormond. I'm the Senior Manager for Global Strategic Sound Development. Bit of a mouthful. Um, (laughs) So I work for a company called Brownwatch. So basically we help large global brands and smaller businesses as well understand their consumers at the speed of social. So social listening, taking all that data online and putting it into actionable insights for them. Um, Yeah, based in Brighton or just outside of Brighton. Um, Yeah, really excited to be back on again, Neil. Well, it's a pleasure and privilege to have you back on, Ash, and thank you for the introduction. So guests and listeners, normally what we do at this point, if it was a brand new guest, is we would go to their LinkedIn profile. But we've been there before. But as a general reminder, Ash's LinkedIn profile will be in the show notes and description. So if you want to connect with him, feel free to reach out and pick his brain. But what I'd love to do at this point is just have a quick recap on the last... It was really, really difficult, right? Um, and I got the kind of nickname of Soldier Boy at the time. Mm. Yeah. What's what I'm thinking? Yeah. Um, but I think for me, it was either... I was kind of faced in with a kind of decision. Do I feel sorry for myself and just like feel like let's go down this negative path of mm. why me? Why has this happened? Obviously, when I was in hospital, like that, but them kind of thoughts happened. Yeah, yeah. It's very like roller coaster ride. Right, right but then on the flip side of that you think right this has happened this is like i'm here for a reason i could have easily- feels like years ago but it was only a couple of months ago yeah. but again as mentioned it's great to have you back on board ash so i think me myself our guests and listeners would love to know since our last discussion what's new with ash so um since last time um as yeah, you probably uh, have heard I was hiring um, quite aggressively. So, yeah. and yeah, thankfully, I have found six new people to join my team who are going to be starting next month. Um, really, really, really excited to have them on board. So it's been it's been a hectic time, I must mm. say. Um, mm. Interviews, yeah, just it's just been so full on, and now it's the the kind of transition into onboarding the plan how can yeah. i ramp these people as quickly as possible because 
um, which might be a surprise to some. Mm-hmm. All of the people that I've hired are not coming from an SDR background. Ooh. Okay, so that, that is – go on, Neil. Yeah, that, that, that isn't – sorry, tell me more, tell me more. Yeah, so if anything, I think this is a bit of a kind of philosophy of mine mm-hmm. um, that I've always kind of encouraged or looked at people – that haven't had an SDR background previously yeah. for yeah. for the reasons of right. Mm-hmm. Um, one, I can mould them into being a high performing SDR. Mm. Two, if the if this is their brand new, like if this is their first time going into a tech role, if you like, yeah, the hunger there is undeniable, mm-hmm. right? And what I found previously is when you hire people who've been in SDR roles before and then mm. they come into a new SDR role, yeah. all they're focusing on is the next step, right? They're not mm. focusing on the journey to get to that next step, whichever yeah. which it may be. Yeah. So, um, and ultimately it opens up the pool, right? The talent mm. pool for a number of different people out there. And I think going from people's experience, um, personal experience, and also different sales experience they're currently in, I think it's just, yeah, it's just always worked really well for, for my team, basically. Um, yeah, a lot of re- ex-recruiters coming on board. Mm, I love that. I love that. Well, first and foremost, congratulations for getting six new members onto your team. Thank they you. They're very lucky to have you in as a manager. I Good think there's... Time, yeah. There's, there's three sides of this that I'd love to explore because mm-hmm. with some people, and I've seen it on LinkedIn, the job market is crazy in tech and sales. And, mm-hmm. you know, one of the priorities for an SDR or BDR manager is hiring. And that's one of the hardest things to do. Mm-hmm. So the three points or pillars I'd love to ask your thoughts or get insight into is what was it like hiring? Mm-hmm. What worked for you to get in these six people? Mm-hmm. I'd love to delve on the personalities or the things that you saw worked really well in these people's interviews for them to be selected. Yeah. Um, And then once we've concluded with that, I then kind of want to go on to a bit more about personal dev. But first Mm -hmm. one is what worked for you to get these six people in? Um, So I can't take all the credit, you know, although I'd love to. Um, I think we've got a, a... I'm very lucky that I work with an, an exceptional internal recruiter. So mm. she's been doing a really good job um, going out there. But of course, she's supporting other sales teams as well. Yeah. So I'm very active on kind of LinkedIn when it comes to hiring. I will go out and I will approach people myself. We'll get mm. referrals in and so on. But I think for me, um, I wanted to have a, like a, a bit of a process in place to mm. ensure they knew or they understood what they was coming into. Obviously, if you're coming from a recruitment background, you're going to be used to jumping on the phone all day, right? Mm -hmm. And talking to people all day. The difference is connect rates when you're an SDR are are vastly different, right? Mm -hmm. People are not sitting around waiting for you to call them for a job. People (laughs) are working, you know? So it's it's that kind of nuance that you have to kind of be upfront and honest with everyone. so I would, yeah, get people to do a mock cold call um, after they send me a cold email. So I'd give mm. them the scenario and get them to send it over and then we'd discuss it on the, their interview. Mm. Um, but for me, I would say the thing that stands out and the thing that works well is yeah. I focus more on the questions they ask rather than the mm. answers they give. Mm. Mm. Being an SDR is all about curiosity, right? Yeah. And if you can't sit there and ask me some really good questions, then you're not going to do it to someone at sea level when you're reaching out to massive global companies, right? Yeah. I love, I love, I love, I love all of that, and I, I can relate. So, you know, working closely with your recruiter or talent acquisition person and also understanding they've got their own key person targets hit and they're trying to hire for the rest of the business i remember one great recruiter rose if you're listening rose um she was helping me build out the team at happio but we really took the time to go out for lunch she said she understands what we're looking for in terms of an sdr but she wanted to know what does it mean to be an sdr what's Mm. their day-to-day what's the personality types you know, what's the hunger you're looking for and all of that. And I think 
having that conversation with your recruiter helps them source mm. the type of people that you want. And I also love how you said about, you know, the questions they ask you. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, um, I would, as a, as a former manager, like, what do you know about the business? What do you know about our founder's journey? What do you know about our products, competition, logos, and whatnot? But I was more, to your point, understand, wanting to know about their curiosity about mm -hmm. us. So what does onboarding look like? What does progression look like? What is the team dynamics like? How can you help me? These are the things I was looking for. Mm -hmm. But to your point, it was kind of like, um, not a, yeah, you could almost say like the interview is a role play of a role play of what would they look like in front of prospects? Yeah. You know, how would they handle that conversation and their business acumen and level? And I wouldn't expect them to be perfect and polished because that's my job to help them become that you know, and take the obstacles out of their way mm -hmm. to help them out. <laughs> but um, I think when I'm coaching and I'm coaching reps to go through interviews, I do also ask them, like, what questions have you prepared for them? Mm -hmm. And some are stumped. I'm like, uh, what should I ask? So I'd yeah. love to know, what do you think are good questions for a rep to ask the manager in the interview, Ash? Um, I think that's a, that's a really good question. Isn't it? And uh, There's a lot to unpack there, Neil. That's for sure. <laughs> um, I'd like to start by saying there's some really bad questions okay. that, I've, that I've had. Yeah. Um, one that stands out to me during this recruitment process was someone was asking me, they asked me, where do I see myself in five years, right? So I thought, mm. like, they're, they're kind of laying the ground, so they're going to dig into something. And mm. then they asked me, like, how I felt when I went into being an SDR. And they they really didn't ask any questions that they learned anything from other than from me. Mm. And then at the end, I asked them, I said, during this whole interview stage, what have you learned that you didn't know before? Mm. And they, they kind of sat there and thought, you could see them thinking, mm. and then it was like, nothing. I was like, this was, you've, you've missed a little bit of an opportunity here. This mm. was your chance to find out about your role. What are the challenges? What, what to expect? I'm an open yeah. book, right? I will tell yeah. you the good, bad, and the ugly. Like, mm. it really, because I'd rather just tell you everything now, up front, mm. so you, you're, you're not surprised by anything moving forward, right? Yeah. Um but I think some really good questions I've had. Um, God, some really good questions I've had. There's been so many. I think I think generally it is not just about asking one question, right? It's about building on that question. Like, what, why is that important to you? What, like, just really having that curiosity. I, I know I'm not giving you any answer there. In terms <laughs> of a kind of, I don't want to give too much away, you know, to yeah. people. Um, or perhaps to give your mind time to recollect those things. Mm. If if I kind of uh, share a story where, you know, they're asking questions and it feels like it's scripted. Mm. You know, we've all been there. Maybe we Google what questions should we ask the hiring manager on there. But what they may be missing is the act of listening mm -hmm. and then following up on from that question. So what have you learned in the career whilst you were here? What do you learn as an SDR? But what mm -hmm. were your mistakes? The follow-up question is, how did you overcome them? The mm -hmm. follow-up to that could be, how long did that take for that to click? Yeah. You know? And also, like, I think really good questions are also, you know, like how, many, how much of the team are hitting target? Um, mm -hmm. How long does it take to be fully productive and efficient coming into your team? And similar to yourself, I have always been an open book. Um, and it kind of sounds, uh, I remember I used to get a lot of jip from VPs of sales with my interview style. Yeah. But I would say, like, this is tough. You face rejection on a daily mm. basis. It's really hard to connect with people. Some people may see our solution as a nice to have rather than a need to have. Yeah. Um, because I wanted to be open and say how freaking hard it can be. But if you're up for the challenge, come on board because we've got a bunch of people that are also working towards the same goal. Yeah. And a lot of VPs have said, like, Neil, you need to sell the role. We need to, like, hit our hiring target. I'm like, yeah, I get that. But if I get somebody where I'm just selling, it's like a, a bad salesperson where you just want them to sign the deal. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then what happens is you bring on the customer. They realize the product's not up to scratch. It's not what they were expected. And guess what happens? They churn. And that can happen with hires as well. But 
the the thing that I used to say to the VPs was, you know, if we bring this person on board and it doesn't work out, that could cost us 3x their salary because we have onboarding, equipment, hiring, but then we have to do that in reverse when they leave and exit the business. So I'd rather have the people that are ready to roll up the sleeves and do it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I can totally rate, but coming back to yourself with the questions. Yeah. So, um, and I think you just touched on something there. I think like you can't over promise, right. And under deliver. And that's just hmm. the same event, anything. Um, I think what one of the, a, a really good question that made me think was someone asked me, um, at, like you said about the, how much of the team are hitting quota and yeah. stuff like that. And then they said, what, what are you like? as a coach or a person mm. when things are not going so well ah, and it really yeah. made me kind of sit there and, and kind of think of a scenario when like maybe we wasn't where we needed to be uh, and in terms of kind of target and stuff like that like people had left it was really difficult and it made me think like what was mm. I like during that time yeah and then it made me think after the interview as well of like how how could I how could I pinpoint that moment and learn from it you know um and i think that went into kind of the kind of self-reflection kind of aspects as well and mm. i think any kind of questions that really make someone think especially mm. an interview yeah um and my advice would definitely be don't be afraid to ask difficult questions during mm. an interview as well yeah. it really is a two-way street like mm. massively a two-way street and if you don't treat it like that then I think you're you're there for the taking. To be honest, I think you'll 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 probably get more no's than you will yeses. You know, yes. and not, I've been helping or like others that are not even at Brown Watch, not even applying for Brown Watch, like other people just across LinkedIn mm. who have come to me and asked for some help, help in terms yeah. of um, interviews and stuff like that. And I mean, there's some really good people out there, but I think for for me it is asking about the right questions. But I think prior to that as well, I saw a post on LinkedIn the other day and it um, said about an email that you should send the hiring manager hmm. um, to stand out from the crowd. And although it was a really good email, and although I do encourage people to do that, yeah. I think you, you just got to jump on the phone and just pick up and speak to the hiring manager. That is yeah. the number one thing. Um, I think maybe four out of the six people mm. cold called me prior ah, so you did uh, get a call in the end and a couple yes i, but, I was screaming out for it though Neil, <laughs> yeah, and I yeah. on linkedin but um i think yeah yeah there's a number of different things you can do to stand out right okay so we've definitely got great insights about the recruitment drive the tactics and how to approach that interview so i'd love to know mm -hmm. on that second pillar um what was it about those candidates that did stand out in the interview that made you think like yeah you're coming on board um i think the the questions they asked were yeah like number one it made you really think that they could ask some really good questions when they're in front of prospects yeah um i think a lot of it was there was one one guy it, I was just, his calmness, you know, mm. he was so calm. It didn't yeah. matter what I was asking him or how the conversation was going. He was so unbelievably calm and collected. And then um, he said he'd been kind of rejected a couple of times prior. Um, mm. And when we'd done his mock call, it was, it was really good. He had a really good structure. And I always say to everyone, look, it's not... I'm not looking for perfection here. I'm just looking yeah. for a bit of a framework and how you'll overcome objections and, and the listening part. Mm. And he, he just kind of blew me away. And literally after I said that that was the best one I've had during my time here recruiting. Mm. Um, and later on, I, I sent him an offer. Mm. Um, so, I, I yeah, I think just how you come across, obviously the, the research part, is really important as well mm -hmm. um i've had people that have clearly done zero research i think even not knowing the the types of products we have or the names of them well i'm not asking people to um, be the expert yeah do you yeah. know what i mean like i can coach them that but yeah. 
that demonstrates a willingness and a desire to join your business, right? Mm-hmm. That you've done your research, you've you've checked out the competitors. Even if you don't say these are your competitors, you can slip it into your answers or even questions that mm-hmm. just like ticks off boxes. And yeah. I think the the people that I interviewed um, and hired, they were so good at that as well. They yeah. all knew what we were doing where we were going what products we and and also the challenges we'd face right Mm. um and i think for brand watch in general we sell to so many different different um personas yeah different verticals like there's there's no one clear icp so it is Mm. quite difficult for people coming into the business to get their head around that yeah yeah. but some of them just kind of knew you know they just Mm. knew it and had that kind of desire that our willingness to to get stuck in mm. um and the follow-ups were, were brilliant as well after every interview they would yeah. just follow up with a message um just thanking me asking for next steps and i think a, another important thing they all closed me at the end mm. um have you got any reservations about me is there anything you'd like me to elaborate on what are the next steps and i think that bodes well um during an interview process i love that i love that such such great advice and i think to because a lot of people that i'm either coaching or you know in the linkedin dms are looking for help i think those are some really great insights and tips and goes beyond some of the the tips that i've given to people but i think going back to when i was a hiring manager things that stood out to me i i did the same thing as you i i love to hire people that didn't have a sales background predominantly for the reasons like you said they're moldable they're coachable they're mm. fresh, they're clean. This is a new world to them because it's that thing of you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And I agree with your point of if they've been an SDR in a previous organization, there are some habits and some mindsets that they can't get out of based mm. on their previous experience. But with these new people, um, and even thinking back to my time at Happio, I, I, I hired somebody straight fresh out of uni that was studying law, somebody who had a psychology background than somebody who had a performing arts, like comedy clubs background. <laughs> nice. uh, and they'd also tried yeah. to do their own startups in, in the back end as well. I had somebody that worked in traditional manufacturing sales, no yeah. you know, experience of software or tech or anything like that. Uh, I've hired recruiters because I knew they're really good hunters and they're already versed in all having good conversations with MDs or C-level. Yeah, um, 100%. But I think part of it came from my own background of not working in sales Mm -hmm. and the fact that sales changed my life in terms of my earning potential my quality of life my my education my learning and what i would love to do is get more people into this so sometimes Mm -hmm. i'm not saying i found a soft side to them but i wanted to help these people but they had to be able to help themselves first so things that i really loved was the ones that did send me linkedin requests before the interview saying they're looking forward to having a chat with me um some not many people gave me calls but i would get videos on the linkedin dm or a voice note that really was like oh i like that yeah hundred and i can imagine some of our listeners saying well if you've not worked in tech and sales and prospecting maybe you're not aware of doing these things and 100 percent agree so that's why i don't expect it but it did Mm. help them stand out but why we're having this show is to help those people that are thinking about it the things that you could do to stand out with it yeah other things that really stood out to me was people joining the zoom or the recruitment interview a couple of minutes early because if you turned up late three to five minutes again it's not the end of the world but that makes me think of how would you connect with that prospect Mm -hmm. um the other things like similar to yourself they didn't have to be an expert in our products or solutions because that comes with the training the onboarding uh, and the coaching but i wanted them to give me in their own opinion what we do and a question that i used to ask them was like ash you've probably been on our website and stuff if you were to explain to your friends and family at dinner what our company how would you explain it Mm. because i just wanted to understand did they grasp the concept they don't have to fully explain it but just grasp the concept of what we do or the space Mm-hmm. that we're in yeah uh, also you know um they wouldn't have to tell a full customer story but they could quote a couple of customers we have but say why they bought us or why mm-hmm. they became a customer that was really good um yeah and I it was won't... just sorry go ahead 
I was going to say, I always ask um, if, if you had like a magic wand or you could paint the picture of our perfect customer, what, mm. who would that be and why? Nice. And I think that, that stumped a few people, but other people mm. just seem to grasp it straight away. Um, yeah. So, it's, it's, yeah, just, and I suppose, like you say, it's just trying to get them to demonstrate that they, yeah. they just get it, right? And I think yeah. going into like a SaaS or a tech role, there's so many nuances. There's so. Mm. There's there's so many things that you won't know, right? Coming into yeah. this, and especially with the uh, the abbreviations of different things, <laughs> the acronyms and everything. Yeah, yeah, you're never gonna you're never gonna know that unless you're in this kind of world. And I think mm. for me, it was more demonstrate the effort that you've put in, right? Mm. Rather than just showing up and just hoping for the best. Like yeah. it, it's all about the effort, and I think that is an SDR's role, right? You mm. can have all the skill in the world, but if you don't put the effort in, mm. you're getting nowhere, right? Yeah. But if you're lacking a few bits of skill here and there, but mm. you've got shit loads of effort, yeah. you're 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 on your way, right? That yeah. is the hardest bit, I think, for this yeah. role is the the putting in the consistent effort yeah. of picking up the phone when you don't want to. You yeah. know? You're right. It's um, as uh, to quote John Barrows, it's the give a shit factor. You know, you can definitely tell like somebody that. who has a vested interest versus somebody who's just doing it for the sake of it. And, you know, thinking back to the interviews, I had some people where I knew I was a number in their calendar in a number of interviews. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. Like, you know, you're on the hunt for the right opportunity as you would as a salesperson. Um, but questions to kind of kick off the interview, I would ask, you know, like, um, you know, we, we, uh, I used to ask them like, what do you know about me? And what I was looking for is some, so the great ones is that, Oh, I checked out your LinkedIn. I see that you've got your own sales training company. I've seen that back in the day you was at this company. I haven't read for much, but I've had a good, just like a nose round. And mm -hmm. I said, that's enough. So that shows me ahead of the call, you're reviewing who I am. But if the people said, Oh, I don't know. Not good. But at that point, I'd say, okay, look, so if, and, but then I would educate them in the interview and then say, so if you're going to be connecting with prospects, one of our main channels would be on LinkedIn, where you'd look at, uh, you know, do a little bit of homework three to five minutes before jumping on a call or writing an email. So that's really important. So it was, if you haven't done it, I'll teach you what you need to be doing. Because what I'm also hoping is they can take this into the next interview if that's where mm. they're going, right? Yeah. Feedback's important. Yeah. Uh, the other questions I wanted to know is like, what do you know about our history? And this would stump some people because they'd be looking at the website 30 seconds before the call. All right, you provide a social media management platform, something. But then, you know, if you're looking at Eric Lobar Larson, the founder, Falcon Social, Brand Watch, they did this back in the day and all of that. I'm, I wanted mm -hmm. to know what they, their curiosity was and of knowing who we are and how we were built. Um, but again, out, out of interest, Neil, yeah. why do you think that type of question? would be important to ask hmm. like the, the kind of history good point because i think when uh we're selling products and services initially with most startups the founders realized a problem back then mm -hmm. which then prompted them to start creating a solution around that thing and that's kind of where the startup was born and again some people may not be aware of that's the case but i think Going back to my first SDR job, um, Zora, Tinzo was the CMO and employee number 11 at Salesforce.com. And he saw the world moving to subscriptions, but he knew that Salesforce was only built for one-time transactional business and it wouldn't be able to handle this new shift. Mm. So we went to Mark Benioff and said, I'm going to go build a billing engine for subscription businesses and SaaS businesses. And Mark said, cool idea here's 50 million go build it i'm going to buy you one day and teens said you're not going to buy it we're going to go public that was inspirational for me nice. to think uh, mm -hmm. and and i'm going off on a little bit of a tangent but the other lesson that i learned from teen in the world of startups he says you either have the disruptors or the disrupted mm -hmm. right so he said uh we are disrupting the erp space so we're going up against the the sap's the oracles the success factors of the world, the net suites, like we're coming to mess up their market. And he said, sometimes what happens, Neil, is these little innovative startups come along 
and the big dogs don't look at them, but then loads of people start getting into that and they become disrupted. And what either happens is they pivot or they acquire these smaller companies. Mm -hmm. So if we think of a, a real life example of uh, a startup that disrupted the industry was Uber. Because prior to that, it was black cabs in London. And I remember being in the Zora office, being the BDR, and we had a company come through called Halo. Mm. And Halo was the booking app for black taxis because they're, you know, I, I don't think they're in business anymore. But we spoke about Uber, the subscription model. I said, yeah, Uber's not going to be around for much. You know, it's all about black cabs. There's a lot of loyalty behind it. Who's going to want to, you know, surge price and that's not going to work. And we convinced them to think about a subscription model. And they said, no, they went out of business, but we all know the history with Uber. But mm. coming back to your point, it's taking a vested interest as to why does this company exist? Mm -hmm. So the advice to the person that didn't know this, I would say, do you know what? Go on Google, just type in the company and put in the founders and just click the news tab. And you can find articles of, you know, funding articles will also say, where did the company start? Who were the original founders? Why did they do this? Because again, I think, uh, you know, you've really asked me a good question, Ash. I think the reason it's a good question is you need to believe in a product in order to sell and prospect for it. And if you understand where it's come from and you believe in that vision and that mission, you're going to be more inclined to want to promote it, talk to prospects versus something you don't really believe in. And I've been there. I've, I've, I've been in companies where I've, I didn't believe in the product. But, um, yeah, really good question. Thank you for that, dude. Um, where, yeah, you've thrown me. You've absolutely thrown me. And I love that. I love that. You've made me think. You've made me think. So, yeah, there's just, a good. Yeah, I was just curious because, um, if anything, when you when you mentioned that, hmm. it, just immediately I thought, why would you care? You know, what, well, hmm. why would you care about that? Um, but I think, yeah, you've explained it really well. Hmm. Um, for me, I don't think it really matters if they know the history or not. Hmm. Um, and that, like, and that that's the that's the good thing about this, right? It's the difference of opinions and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think where like the root of of that question, like you mm. said, is like understanding where they come from to where they're going and stuff like that. That is really good, mm. um, and it, it it does put it in perspective, right? So, mm. and like you say, it's that in, inspiring aspect of it. Yeah. Um, and I suppose you can find out things that you you never knew as well. Mm. Um, like for for Brown Watch, for example, like Brown Watch was created before Instagram was. Yeah. You know, yeah. But, yeah. Like this is the the kind of thing that we're like one of our biggest things is we're, we're like getting data from from them kind of platforms yeah. to make decisions for these large businesses, right? Yeah. Um. So yeah, I thought that was a really good point. But like with anything, mm. um, I think just going back to the feedback piece, yeah, it's all about like what what have you what have you kind of learned and taken from that interview mm. or that research to then go on and move forward with it yeah. because what I really do encourage uh, a lot of people to do when they are seeking new employment or going out and, and looking for, for jobs and so is connect with people in that team. Yeah. Like connect with people in that team, find out the real, like what is actually going on, right? Yeah. No one's going to give you the, the kind of everything that you possibly could want but they can give you a bit of a sense of what's going on, you know. Yeah. I'd encourage that before you apply because yeah. ultimately you might build up a bit of a relationship with that person and they can refer you in, meaning yeah. that you've got your foot in the door and yeah. they can end up getting a bit of referral like bonus out of it as well. Yeah. So that that's a, something I would encourage for sure. I love that. I love that. And you're right, you know, um, coming back to that history piece. So th those, those are two different leadership mindsets. And I love that. Um, and again, it was a great question. Um, and it has actually made me think, well, why would they care about that? Because then again, it was more based on my wants and how I saw it, mm. but then giving the advice as to, you know, go research something to really understand if you want, you want to be there. Right. Um, but I think another thing, which, really helped with you know these people coming on board and referrals are a great way because you get to learn the culture 
the people, what it's actually like to be in that role, what's it like to report to this manager and mm. stuff like that. But I think the other thing kind of where you alluded to earlier, sorry, this is where I'm going with it, is you've hired some people without the sales background. Mm. Another interesting thing for me was those people in the interviews that maybe launched their own cocktail bar business or tried to launch an app or, you know, went on an entrepreneurship uh, degree within their university, or perhaps they had um, their own business with their father, their parents or something, and they tried to do it. What I was looking for, Ash, was the entrepreneurial spark oh, yeah. of trying something themselves. Yeah. And a lot of the SDRs that I spoke to, when we spoke about where do you see yourself going, coming into this role, like what's the motivation behind it? And some of the people said to me, um, one day I want to have my own business, but I want to work in a company that's currently doing it so I get to learn from it. And that used to turn me on in a business <laughs> sense, right? But yeah. I was just like, yeah. Bit weird, Neil. Bit weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But it, it did. It, it made me go, yeah, it, it made me go gaga. But yeah, I think yeah. what was really hard for me was when I had to chat to the VP of sales of all the candidates and why I felt mm -hmm. they were a fit. Some of them push back because oh, we want at least a year experience of the KPIs. Da, da, da. And I said, yeah. here's the thing. If you hire mirrored versions of the current team today, that doesn't help with diversity. Mm. And you want to bring something in a bit different 100%, yeah. to then grow out the team because it's those different personality and traits. Because I said, I don't just want an army of soldiers that look all the same. Mm hmm I want a bit of a mix because that's what enhances the team, right? But yeah. um and I think with that, it's it's more about like the di diversity of thought and mm. experience. And I think that's where um, I've been really lucky because I've got a team of people who have come from different backgrounds, mm. um, different life experiences, and they just it just like it just seems to like work, you know. Mm. Um, and just going back to the entrepreneurship. Um, mm. aspect and, ju and just let's have it right i'm not yeah when i say um i'm hiring people without like tech sales backgrounds yeah they do have some kind of like sales background already it's mm -hmm. not just people just straight out of uni yeah. um because i need that resilience and, and the kind of the, the understanding of like this isn't going to be easy you know mm. but i did hire someone who was actually running his own company mm. he was the founder um and managing director at a company and he was running it for i think it was about five years mm. right straight from uni started running it ended up getting funding for it and stuff mm. like that and on the face of thing it's like that is amazing right yeah, yeah and yeah. i asked him what like why is it that you're leaving that you know because mm. it, the business like he had other people that they collectively started running it together. So the four of his friends were still running it. And then he was taking this turn and he said, look, I just want to go in a like, different direction. And I was like, look, what's the real reason? You know? Mm -hmm. And he said, I don't, I don't anticipate that this is going to like keep going the way it has been. Yeah. Um, so then the question after that is, let's pretend it does go and it like it skyrockets, you know, like, mm, then what? and it does go, uh, would you just naturally leave, the, the kind of SDR role and just go back into it, you know, yeah. and it made him kind of think about that as yeah. well. But it's that entrepreneurial spirit, I think, yeah. is really good. But for me, I've just hired someone on on the kind of flip of that, not mm. someone who's looking to run a business. I'm, I'm hiring someone who's actually run a business, yeah. got funding for it, done really well, and now looking to just go into, because running a business isn't easy, you no. know? no. It consumes your life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. It's interesting that there's so many different types of um, experiences that can crack into tech, I think, for sure. 100%. And the more people coming into the industry uh, from different backgrounds and whatnot really makes me happy because these are, you know, uh, the next wave of leaders, whether it be in sales, marketing, customer success, or founders of their own business. I love to be imagining I'm that small little cog in this person's career mm. and one day they're going to be doing because I've seen it a lot of times where people have gone off and launched their own business and I'm so proud of you or they've been promoted or you know they've gone into a different role or a completely different industry I'm like yeah love that love that but mm -hmm. I think the next topic I'd love to come on to is so in our last episode we were talking about as you just touched upon around the importance 
of resilience, you know, maintaining that positive sort of mindset. So like with this um, new team that's coming on board, you're going to be going through the onboarding, training and ramping them up. Yeah. What are your thoughts on helping them with personal growth? How are you looking to implement that? Mm -hmm. And, you know, including when they get the rejections, they get the setbacks or things haven't gone out where they're fresh and this is all new to them. How are you looking to implement personal growth and development for these new people? I think that's a that's a really good question. It's, it's something that's been at the forefront of my mind, I would say. Mm. So I think once the the kind of mindset is right, everything else will fall into place. Mm. I think um, this isn't an easy job, right? No. Yeah. It really isn't. There's times where, and it's not even just about the rejection, right? It's not even about getting on the phone and then speaking to someone and getting rejected. I mm. think it's the, the, a bit of a slog beforehand where you're trying to get through to someone and all you're hitting is voicemails all day, you know? Mm. Um so that's something that I've really taken into account. So, and I think one of the the SANA rules is you have to fail. Um, sometimes you have to fail to win. Yeah. So what I what I'm trying to install is like a, a culture of let's fail fast, right? Let's mm. fail fast. Mm. Let's try different things, um, and then we can kind of kick on and try different aspects. So we know what we need right to kind of hit quota right we know like how many calls it takes to book a meeting like on average and we've got all them kind of numbers in place right yeah. so spend 80 percent of our time doing those those regular day-to-day -day tasks to to get us where we need to be and then 20 percent of their time trying yeah. different things yeah right and then if they try different things like video outreach voice notes whatever and that starts getting results, mm. then put that into your 80% and then use yeah. that 20 to try something else. Try, test it, measure it. Have you got any success from it? And it keeps it fresh. Mm. And I think for them, that that will help in terms of like mindset and mm. trying different things and them things not working out. But it's okay, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, and I think it's like all that, a test, isn't it? It's like testing and finding out together, right? hundred yeah. percent and if anything i think with the the coaching that we're, we're lucky to have as well there's elements of that that are going to be around kind of mindset mm. right getting into the right mindset and just knowing that there will like there's going to be more rejections more heartache more like challenges than there are wins sometimes yeah right yeah so it's just trying to keep that that steady level of when you're when you're having a challenge, don't go too low. Don't mm. think it's the end of the world. Yeah. And when you're when you're having a win, don't think that this is it. You've made it right because mm. it ain't. It'll click. It can quickly just be sweeped under your feet, right? Mm. Um, so I, I, I'm going to focus a lot around the different roles that they play. So yeah. they've got the 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 husband the the boyfriend the 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 brother the the sister the that's the role outside of work right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and then they got the role of SDR or ADR inside of work mm -hmm. so like just for, like the gym for example yeah. right you go to the gym at the gym you smash it out you're a gym rat right yeah. <laughs> you're a gym rat fully fledged going in there your vest yeah. on whatever um, sometimes you might not have a good session yeah. right. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you're a bad person. Mm. That doesn't mean that you're failing mm. in life. Mm. And that kind of mindset and taking that mindset into your SDR work day and saying, I've had a bad day. But that doesn't mm. mean that you can go on and you're having a bad life. You've made a bad decision. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. you leave it at the door. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really important. And I think, yeah, having that kind of coaching element as well is is just crucial and i think having that mindset and that resilience throughout your entire life mm. whether it's work outside of work or whatever is so important mm. interestingly um my daughter ava yeah. she's going to be nine this month um actually in five days she's going to be <laughs> nine um she's been going to an after school club on a friday and mm. the, the person there chris um i can't remember his surname um but he runs a course called um the fearless academy right okay. so he he builds up confidence in young children 
mm. right? Gives them the confidence to take on new challenges, the confidence to try different things, the confidence to fail, right? Mm. And learn from those. Um, and because Ava's got autism, di different things challenge her in different ways, right? Yeah. So like loud noises, um, unexpected kind of things changes to routine. routine yeah it's just and yeah like it's really difficult and i think being at that age at primary school to go off on a, a little bit of a tangent go for it please but, but being at primary school it's always difficult anyway right someone says i don't know they point at you and you go oh you look like poo do you know what i mean like other people <laughs> go, oh, no whatever do you know yeah, what i mean yeah. but she would really take that to heart and be like mm. why am i saying that like i'm really analyze that like overanalyze it and she had mm. take that with her. But yeah. since she's been doing this coaching um, with, with Chris, she's ended up like joining a football team. Awesome. Um, and although she's had some really difficult times when she planned the match, because it's very overwhelming, everyone's yeah. shouting, there's loads going on, she doesn't know what to do and stuff like that. The trading is just, oh, it just brings me, it just fills my heart with, joy and love you know yeah, yeah watching yeah. her just get involved smiling happy and it like mixing with different people as well and mm. i think that's the importance of having someone there like a coach for example mm. to give you that freedom or giving you that license to fail and it's okay yeah. you know like yeah. it's okay to try different things and it doesn't work out you know mm. and i think there's so many different situations where that ties into sales, where people feel like they need to be perfect. They need to send the perfect email. They need to do the perfect research. They need to make the perfect opener on their yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's like, that isn't life, you know, mm. nothing in life is perfect. So, mm. but the action you take through anything, that's where you should focus your energy on. Yeah. Can't remember what the question was about a year ago since I started talking, but yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> and I think like um, the the vibe that I'm getting from you know that question of it was around personal development and growth, mm -hmm. and we're definitely going to touch on the the, the autism piece in it because that's something close to my heart. Yeah. But what I'm hearing in that is with your team and the conversations you're having with them and the support that you, you saw also mirror to like your daughter, it's being a voice of reason and clarity mm. and an empathetic voice to say that you don't have to have it perfect. You're, you're, you know, nobody's perfect. We, we try it again, but it's not being that overbearing harsh. You must do it this way. This is the way that it must be done. Regimented, mm. da, 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 da. Um, and talking to them like a human, you know, I think that's, that's the vibe that I'm getting from this. It's that you have an understanding of where they are, what they could be thinking, and then supporting them to help them come to a conclusion. Um, because I think, as, as I've said on the show multiple times, when, when you're a manager, you're kind of wearing three hats. One, which is the managerial of leading a team, creating a strategy, uh, motivating them, um, making sure they're hitting the operating rhythm. Then the other one is you're the operational person where it's the KPIs, the metrics, the science behind the sales and the data. Mm. And the third one, which I'm more of a fan of, and I think why I love coaching is the therapeutic side or being the therapist. So I love how you, you know, you have these different personalities of you being the husband, the girlfriend, the boyfriend, the wife, whatever outside of work. Mm -hmm. And then you're putting on this persona of being an SDR or an ADR within work. It, it is because, um, what do you call it? There aren't just one type of personalities. We have slices of different parts to our personality. Mm. And it's being able to let that person bring those transferable things into that role. So, you know, like uh, I can I can think of him right right now. Tom was one of my SDRs at Happio. He was, you know, in his late 30s and he was applying for his SDR job, but he'd been a business owner, he's done comedy club, he's done performance acting and everything like that. But the thing with something like when he came into role, he said, yeah, you know, I'm kind of older than most SDRs. I said, dude, I'm like 30 odd as well. I love this SDR thing. And I know some SDRs that are <laughs> yeah. older than me still doing this thing. But what Tom could also do, because he was a father where there were reps in our team that were struggling or, you know, having emotional moments, 
he could really bring the best out of them mm. by having a chat, a heart to heart, like giving them passage. Oh, come on, dude, let's let's do that. And I could always, and I, I remember just sitting in the room in Amsterdam, just seeing like, yeah, the dudes, he's got leadership qualities, but he's bringing the other personality type to help enhance that team culture in that as well. Yeah. And uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. Was it good? Yeah, I was going to say, and when, um, yeah, because I started my SDR career in my 30s as well. So mm-hmm. it's just, and I think it just gives you that there's so many things that you can bring into this position mm. that you probably don't even think of yeah. either. Yeah. Um, and I think you hit the nail on the head there with that, um, the, the aspect of the, the therapeutic stuff as well. I think yeah. that is, I think that is ultimately very very important mm. because if people are not happy mm. you're not going to get the best out of them 100 no. percent. if yeah. you're breathing down their neck and just like barking orders at them or you're chasing them for kpis for the sake of kpis they're going to switch off they ain't mm. going to be engaged do you know what i mean yeah. but if you're if you genuinely care about how they progress how they develop and how they learn and give them the tools they need to progress to their next path in their career, mm. then your job's done, right? Yeah. That's all your job is as someone leading an SCR team to give yeah. them the tools they need and the confidence they need to move yeah. on to other roles. You know? Yeah. I, I love that. I was like, I was doing a session this morning uh, with another guest, Josh, and he said, like, your role as a manager is to remove obstacles out of your rep's way to make them successful. Make their life and easier. those obstacles could be mindset. It could be being blocked on how they're doing this or, you know, the emotional side of being knocked with rejection. And again, being that voice of clarity and reason. Um, and, you know, I think I, in my early sales career, like it was only a couple of months of being promoted to a manager, I became a dad. And my whole life perspective changed the way that I looked at everything. I wasn't motivated by the money anymore. Mm. I was motivated by people growing succeeding being happy and you're right if if they're not happy in their outside life and then it will bleed into their work and you know sometimes with my reps i'd look at them then you know performance is low and i'd ask the question like hat aside are you okay because i could get this gut feeling that something it wasn't related to work and sometimes some managers miss that that there could be something going on in their personal life right um and coming to you know as also a father a proud father of my Blakey, he's nine next month. Uh, so we became dads at the same time. Uh, <laughs> who also has autism, right? And that, and uh, do you know what? One thing I'm really happy with is, like, I'm I'm an advocate for autism acceptance, right? Um, and seeing a lot of people on LinkedIn where you're finding out that they've recently been diagnosed in their adult life, mm. they have children with autism, and I freaking love it. But similar to you know the way that you're parenting Ava with Blake so his thing is stagecoach and performance right nice and thinking up until the age of three Blake wasn't verbal he was non-verbal and it was through watching films and songs that he started to grasp his words together and then he started looking at me in the eyes and then when hearing that I love you for the first time and actually responding to a question and not you know ver- non-verbal babbling I was just like oh yeah yeah but as Blake has grown older, it's also learning his moods. So he's new to things in life. So at stagecoach school, it was very overwhelming. There's lots of other people in the class. There are what people may deem as normal children or children without autism. Yeah. Uh, and Blake, you know, not understanding social cues or, or things like that. Um, but the more he did his Saturday classes, all of a sudden, I'm seeing this young boy, my son, who I'm very proud of, uh, growing his confidence, throwing sass back at me, uh, <laughs> dancing around the house and doing his routines and all of that. And I just sit there and I'm picking him up later today. And I sit on the sofa and I don't say anything, but I look at him in admiration of you have come so far. Mm. And I say, it's nothing to do with me. This is all your own thing. But equally, when you know, he did his first performance on a stage in front of the whole school and all the other parents. Oh, wow. I remember just sitting in the back of the auditorium in a, it was an Epsom and seeing my little boy 
do the routine, interacting with the other people doing the the the, the play, and just sitting there. And I, I was in tears. I was just like, I'm so freaking proud of him. But I think when he did his first performance, like uh, in terms of admission, like me and his mother are separated, but we're sitting next to each other, which we hadn't done for a number of years. And when he came off, uh, he was in tears because he found that very overwhelming. But we were both, you know, saying you've done really well. We were saying it really quietly. We said, okay, so what's making you feel that way? Mm. Um, and just saying, look, you, you did really well. Brave. Blake's really brave. Um, but, you know, the subsequent like performances after, my dude's a little diva. Like, he's loving it. He's bowing. He's like all like that. And then he comes run up to me and his mum and like hugging us. And like we're saying, yeah, well done. So. Magical. But he, here's the thing, Ash, with, uh, as a father with a child with autism, because you have to take a different approach rather than being very direct and just saying, do this or that, mm -hmm. but coming down to that, that's the thing I learned with Blake, rather than talking to him when something's gone wrong is I bow down to my knees. So I'm at his level. And this mindset is how I've spoken to my reps is coming down to their level, not coming as an authoritative parent type thing. Mm -hmm. that I'm able to get a better connection with him and also understand. But here's the weird thing, like going on all the other autism workshops and like classes with other parents, finding out the triggers of sensory things like touch, smell, sound, mm -hmm. uh, you know, atmosphere, ambience in the room and all of that. Thinking back to myself, I went through the same challenges my son with autism had and I've almost come to the conclusion that I myself may be on the spectrum because it will answer a lot of things such as I am very OCD with my time. There are certain foods I eat because of the sensory crunch that I get. Mm. I equally get very overwhelmed in like I was in London this week with the My Sales Coach team and I had to keep stepping out of the room a couple of times because my social battery was being drained and I'm not used to having to talk to loads of people. But mm. similarly... When I was younger, it was emceeing and being on a and being on a stage and performing and doing that. And I was just like, yeah. So they say it's hereditary, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I remember being sitting in the room with other parents where there would be some dads that, oh, well, you know, it's just a label, and you know, they should like, when are they going to get fixed? And I was like, there's nothing to fix. It's part of them. Mm. Um, but the more I've met with Blake's teachers and learning and other stuff and meeting some of the other parents, we kind of have this thing where we look at each other like. You're like us. You're, you know, it could be. So I, I'm exploring the idea of potentially going for a formal diagnosis. Mm. Again, we've really opened up. This is why I love having conversations with you, Ash. Uh, but for a father, I think because this is a topic both close to our hearts, what does it mean to you to be a father with a child of autism? And just wondering how, how has that benefited you in life, sir? Um, I mean, it's not, it's not been easy. No. You know, it's it's definitely not been easy. I remember when Ava had her first, well, um, a third birthday party, and and we hired a hall out, and we had a load of people come, and there was music and like a bouncy castle and all this, and she literally gripped on to us, like mm. me and my wife, so tight, and cried the whole time mm. until everyone left, and then she was loving life. Yeah, and it was like what is going on why do you know what i mean maybe it's too loud like we don't know yeah. it's been really really challenging but i think it just gives you that different perspective right that everyone is different mm. um whether they um because i suppose like when you're in school like going back in the day people would be different if they looked different right yeah, yeah. um but now like now having ava and and i've got uh, mia and Vinny as well and she just needs some time away, you know? And I think just, like, it just, when she does things that are, like, small to other people, yeah. it's, like, monumental for us as a family, you know? Yeah. Like, but, like, when she goes to football and she, even when she puts on a kit and she runs over and she, like, says hello to everyone else, like, she doesn't know them, you know? Mm -hmm. She's, like, still getting to know. Even yeah. that makes us proud. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. but other people who are not in that situation, um, where they don't have anyone with like autism, ADHD, etc., mm -hmm. um, they may look at that and go, "Why are they so like? Why are just stand alone?" You know, mm -hmm. but for us, that's like a massive moment, and yeah. um, 
And I think it makes you appreciate these little things, which you can then take into um, like work life mm. and then almost not care about the little things that maybe are not really that important, you know? Um, and it means that you can just focus on the things that matter. And I think that's what the, the, like the biggest thing that I've got from having Ava and, and all my kids, to be fair, yeah. is just try not to sweat the, the small things and just enjoy them while you can. And I think um, just going back to Chris and um, the Fearless Academy, yeah. he, he does like posts uh, on like how to like be a parent or whatnot. Mm. And I think one of the things he said was um, you've, you've only got, really about 13 summers with your children yeah and make them count and when you put it in that perspective it's like shit yeah you ain't got a lot of time left you yeah. know so you might as well enjoy it while you can yeah because i, I think uh definitely where after this episode we're going to get uh, chris's links and i'll be happy to put them in the show notes and help promote that as well yeah um it might be even a great resource for myself but yeah we're, with blake as he's growing older you don't need to do this for me, daddy. Why are you treating me like a child? That's the conversation I'm having with him regularly. Yeah. And, and it's fun. But, you know, to your point of sweating the small stuff at work, I think um, going through this autism journey with Blake and his mother and learning all of these things, I'm able to pick up on some things within people that I've trained, coached or managed. And it has come to light that some of these people are on the spectrum or they have ADHD but it's allowed me to kind of customize the way that I interact with them. Mm. And one story which, like, um, it, it warms my heart from an experience that I had whilst working in a Belgian tech company. For privacy, I'm not going to mention their name. But um, I joined a startup where I had a team of SDRs and HR approached me um, after working like a couple of quarters and there was a lot of good feedback about Neil being a good, nice manager and a really one with the heart is what they said. Oh, nice. Um, they approached me and said, we currently have an employee who works on data entry and mm -hmm. they're on the autistic spectrum. And we're wondering if this person can report to you. And I was just like, first I was just like, yeah, my kids got autism. So I understand it. And I think that's where the request was really coming from. Yeah, And it was, you know, they kind of said this person, um, you know, sometimes it can't be around the team. They need to follow certain procedures of how to work and how to be an employee. And sometimes, you know, uh, they can have outbursts and meltdowns. And kind of what I heard was we have somebody with autism working within our company, but we don't know how to manage them because of the autism. Yeah. And in my head, I was just like, I've never managed anybody with autism before. You know, at a level which is at adult level. But anyway, I just, as Neil with anything, I'll jump in and just say, I'll have a go, right, is the way I put it. So meeting this individual, um, the first thing when meeting with them, they we were sitting at the table and they weren't looking at me because I was new. I was alien. I was a different person. Mm -hmm. um, but then I had a picture of, which is here, which is of my little Blakey. And I advise that my son is on the autism spectrum. And then they looked at me like, straight in the eye. And then I said, and they wanted to know more about Blake and what it was like. And then I asked about him, what he does. And he told me that he goes on trips with his father around the world. They have hobbies and things together. Like, oh, that's really oh, awesome. Yeah. Um, and then anyway, so a week later, the HR people said, this person really likes you. And he doesn't normally trust people. And the fact that he looked you in the eye, because people with autism find that very intimidating when you directly look at them straight in the eye or talk to them. That's why they sometimes may look to the side. And Blake was the same. Um, but he said he's happy to report to you. I said, oh, awesome, cool. But cut long story short, this person went from data entry and he was so smart. Um, we got him on to, he started working with operations. He then started becoming sales development support. So he was enhancing what, Cognism was adding to our database. He kept our CRM clean. Oh, I can imagine. Like, he, he was amazing. He was meticulous. Um, and we had regular one to ones every week. And it, I kind of felt like this parenting figure of looking after him. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when I joined, he only had data entry, but then he had three positions in the company and he was working with everybody else. And the way I looked at it was I kind of saw my son within this person. And I said, this is maybe what I've got to look forward to when Blake is older. And he helped me understand 
how my Blakey might be thinking and why things will alarm him. And, and he helped me come, become a better dad. So I feel he helped me become a better understanding of somebody within the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. And in return, I helped him have a voice in that company. And I still chat to him every now and then. And I'm super freaking proud of him. But That's yeah, lovely. we've really gone deep. And yeah, mm. I love this. This is freaking yeah. awesome. Yeah, <laughs> that is a, that's a lovely story. And I think that just helps with um, even just like understanding people who haven't got autism or ADHD mm. or, or anything like that. Um, it just really puts into perspective that they might be feeling things. And I think it's just really important as a, as a kind of leader to have that high emotional intelligence. And I think yes. having, yes. um, having, having that is just absolutely crucial to just pick up different nuances with people that they wouldn't normally do or they wouldn't normally act and just ask them. Right? Um, because, yeah, you just got to create that kind of environment of, yeah, just being open and, and transparent, I think, for yeah. sure. Hundred percent, and they always say like um, people that you meet, they they'll always teach you something. So whether it's you know in sales of reps that you manage or meet, they teach you something about yourself or how you can you know help other people. And sometimes mm. where people have been difficult, like with prospects, you know, they teach you how to be resilient. And I think another piece that I heard from my therapist recently, where he said, Neil. With resilience, a lot of the time people think of it having meaning you had to have a hard and tough, strong mind. But he said the other side of resilience is knowing when to let go mm. and becoming comfortable with that. So letting go of the outcome, letting go of the fear of rejection, letting go of trying to be a perfectionist and just rolling with the punches and see where you kind of land. Uh, yeah, this has been a beautiful conversation with you, Ash. Uh, I think there may be a part three in the in in the future uh, <laughs> coming up because <laughs> we can talk for hours, dude. We can. Um, but I just wanted to kind of like come come to a conclusion. So mm -hmm. obviously, in the first episode, we learned um, a lot about alternative career paths, personal development, sales techniques, your own journey from recruitment, then coming into sales leadership, and now you've got these six. Uh, people that are lucky to have you and coming on board what all right so let's imagine the future ash mm -hmm. is going to watch this episode yeah what three bits of advice would you give to your future self ash um three bits of advice i'd give my future self would possibly be um maybe wear a hat next time um, <laughs> so um i would say just keep doing what you're doing just keep doing what you know what's working try different things and don't be afraid to say no to things mm. i think i think as leaders you always kind of want to take on different things right and you sometimes you take on too much um so it's just having that kind of ability to just kind of push stuff away mm. when you're up against it yourself you know um just to kind of manage the time i would say I love that. Gun finger salute. That's some solid bars, my dude. I love that. Um, so again, I wanted to say also a big thank you to our listeners, watchers, and subscribers who've joined us on this second chapter with Ashley. So as a reminder, uh, Ashley's LinkedIn profile will be in the show notes in the comments if you'd like to connect with him, pick his brain on any of the topics that we've discussed today. And I'll also be putting the link into the original episode that preceded this one. And also we'll get in the links for, for, for Chris with Fearless uh, to, to educate anybody and also to educate myself. But um, to support us in the SDR Disco Call Show, my request and simple request, it's quite easy for everyone to do, is if you're listening to this in your local podcast platform, please give us a rating and share this chapter. And if you're watching this on YouTube, what would really help out is a like, comment and subscribe. And equally, share this with anybody that you think could benefit from Ashley's advice and the things that we've discussed today. But Ashley Ormond, uh, one daddy, to, a sales daddy to another. Thank you so much for coming on board. Thanks again, Neil. Awesome weekend. Appreciate uh, happy it. Happy selling. You're more Thanks. than welcome, mate. Thank you. Bye-bye.